Yes, I am. Thank you. Just to add a little bit to the wonderful introduction of your teacher here, I am a member of the Congregation of the Fathers of Mercy, of the Immaculate Conception, of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You might have noticed on my left breast here I have a badge. That doesn't mean I'm a sheriff, but it means is that if you look at the badge, there is an image of the prodigal, the merciful father welcoming the prodigal son. How many has heard of the story of the prodigal son in the Bible? Don't be afraid. Hey, I'm a school teacher. I'm an old school teacher myself. Okay. All right. Can somebody tell me a little bit about the prodigal son? Just a little brief summation. What was it all about? And we like to. Okay. Yes. Right. Right. So it's really a story about how a person falls into mortal sin. They realize the foolishness and gravity of what they've done. Then they travel back to the Father for reconciliation. Now, this badge represents the spirit of the missions of what the Fathers of Mercy do. See, we travel all over the world. I've been here in Australia five times. I hope to make it five more times before I die. I'm 62, so I guess I got a good shot at it. And we've been to India. We've been to Europe, Latin America, Mexico, uh, India, other parts of the world. The reason for our missions is to bring people back, the prodigal sons and daughters of today, back into reconciliation with God. And our preaching is a medium by which we do that. So that's why we are going to Australia and the far ends of the earth. Of course, I'm 11,000 miles away from home, so I'm a little bit, I'm going the distance a little myself. So this is the purpose of what our missions is. Now, I was asked to speak a little bit today about the Holy Spirit, since this is what you're studying. And I'll ask to ask a question, okay? Can somebody tell me what the Holy Spirit is? Just raise our hands, and that way we'll have a little order. Okay. Can anyone tell me what the Holy Spirit is, or who the Holy Spirit is? Think of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is what? Member of the Trinity, right? Okay. He's a member of the Holy Trinity. And there's a certain kind of, each person represents a certain element or dimension of God. So the Holy Spirit, what's one uh, word for the Holy Spirit? It kind of links with your study about the blind side. Holy Ghost, okay? I'm thinking of a particular quality. Yeah, okay. Okay, how about this statement? God is what? God is what? Have you heard of that in the Bible? John. God is great, yeah. God is good, yeah. You take that O, G O D, and put it, and God is good. We'll get to that in a little bit. But God is what? Yeah, he's divine. So that's one element of the Holy Spirit, right? Divine. But also something else. God is the Father. God is love. Love. You see? So when we think of the Holy Spirit, we would think of God's love manifest to the dust. And how do we know that God loves us? What's one thing he did we celebrate on Easter Sunday? He rose from the... He died for us, right? That's why we know God uh, loves us. They say that when you look at the cross, you should look at God's arms opening up to love you. That's what they say. Isn't that a wonderful insight? And what did God say? We'll talk about love here in the Holy Spirit. No greater love is this than what? What does the Holy Scripture say? What is the greatest love? No greater love is this than... God laid down his life for his friends. 
Okay? So the greatest form of love is what we call self-sacrificial love. Our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. He sacrificed himself on the cross for our salvation. And that's the ultimate proof and test he loves. You know, he died for each and every one of us. And you know, the Holy Spirit gives us this knowledge and understanding, and it deepens. Now, are all of us confirmed? Most of us confirmed? All right. Those you have been confirmed, you have already received in you the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? Twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit. All these are already in you. All it needs to be is to be activated. How do you activate this power of the Holy Spirit within you? It's already in you. It's through your studies. It's through your education. It's through your prayer. It's through coming to Mass, receiving Jesus. I understand that you go, uh, you have Mass once a week, right? Is that correct? And then you have Eucharist Adoration once a week? Something like that? Okay. All right. And, of course, you have prayer, what, you pray hours or prayer times? That's very important. Because all these things develop the power of the Holy Spirit, the love, the 12 gifts, seven gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the 12 fruits, you see? Because Mass, who do you receive in Mass? Jesus, okay, you receive the Holy Eucharist. What's in the Holy Eucharist? Can somebody tell me what the Holy Eucharist is? Okay, can we add to that? Blood of Christ, right? Okay, so the Eucharist is the body and the blood and the soul because you receive the Holy Spirit when you receive Jesus. Did you know that? When you receive Jesus, you receive the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit that you receive in confirmation is strengthened every time you receive Eucharist. So you receive the body and the blood and the soul and the divinity the sake of humanity, and the one divine person of our Lord Jesus Christ who's really, truly, personally, and sacramentally present to each and every one of us. And you know, we have a saying in the United States, I think you have it here too. When you think and understand who we receive, it's awesome. The experience of receiving Jesus in the Holy Eucharist is awesome because God comes in you. Do we realize that? Wow! So I like to say, Eucharist is the God food of the God man that makes us God bearers. So when God's in you, He gives you the power. Like an old song back in the 70s, you got the power of God to do what? To what is humanly impossible, but possible with God's grace. See, the Eucharist, the Holy Spirit, confirmation, prayer that we receive the power of the Holy Spirit, gives us the power, capability to extend and do things beyond our human capacity with grace. And what is that? The salvation of ourselves, our family, our nation, and our world. It gives you power to think, to evangelize, to witness to your faith. See, all these things receive the Eucharist. Now let's talk about a little about this. Eucharist is a food, right? Right? Tastes like bread. Tastes like wine. Now, why do we receive this food? What is it about food? Person doesn't eat food. Person doesn't eat. What happens? Die. Person eats one meal a day. What happens? Yeah, it's kind of malnutrition, right? They may not die, but they don't grow very well. They get skinny, right, and weak and everything. Okay, person eats three meals a day like they're supposed to. What happens? They get big and strong, right? They grow their full potential. Same thing when you receive the Eucharist. The more you receive the Eucharist, the stronger your faith, the stronger your life of grace, the stronger your capability to witness your faith and withstand temptation to make the right lifestyles, right lifestyle choices. You know, I want to encourage you. Is anyone here thinking about being a priest? How about being a sister? How about marriage, matrimony? Oh, we always get a few, right? 
Great. Okay. And you know, if that spirit is moving you, I want to be a priest, a sister, a married. Go with it. Go with it. Because I tell you, that is the Lord leading you to what he wants you to do. God has a plan for every one of us. And that's one of the things the Holy Spirit tells us. You know, I was confirmed. What, what's the average age of confirmation here? Sixth grade? Fifth grade? Eleventh grade? Eleven years old. Okay, I'll, I'll, I will receive confirmation a little bit younger than that. I was ten years old, fifth grade. By the time anyone want to guess when I knew from the Holy Spirit what God wanted me to be? I was twelve years old. That's the second time this has happened. Something about Australia. Now, I asked a grade six a couple of days ago. This is the second time the person's answered right off the bat. I was 12 years old, and I was in the sixth grade when I knew from the Holy Spirit because I was maturing in the Holy Spirit from confirmation that I knew God wanted me to become a priest. That was 50 years ago. I'm 62 now. So that was in the American spring, April, May of 65, 1965. And you know, after that, life was easy. Once I knew God wanted me to be a priest, well, well, I go to Catholic school, that's what I got to do. Got to study philosophy and theology and Greek and Latin. I got to go to the uni, you know, where I went to Loyola Chicago many years ago, go to grad school and go to seminary. And so once you find out what God wants you to do, that spirit, that Holy Spirit that's in you, follow it. Listen to it. Now, what are some of the names for the Holy Spirit? One in the name, the Holy Spirit of what? Truth, right? That's one of the names of the Holy Spirit. We'll write it here. Truth. Okay. So one of the names of the Holy Spirit is truth. All right? Now, what about some of the symbols of the Holy Spirit? What are some of the symbols of the Holy Spirit? You see it in Scripture, maybe, and I'm sure you studied it. Think of a bird, and not the galar. Dove! Good. So, what does the dove represent as far as the Holy Spirit's concerned? Peace, right? So, we could say that the Holy Spirit, you got to forgive me, I'm an American, I'm boisterous, enthusiastic, you know, typical... Anyways, peace. What is peace? St. Augustine defined peace as the absence of conflict, tranquility of order. When your life is well ordered, that means when you're living according to the Ten Commandments and the God, and you're receiving the Eucharist, and you're going to Mass, and you're going to confession at least once a month, your life is well ordered, and you have peace. There's no strife or conflict in you, you see? So, great, dove, one of the uh, symbols of the Holy Spirit. What's another symbol of the Holy Spirit? What happened? Remember Pentecost Sunday? Flames. Flames. There you go. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Now think about fire. Okay? Think about fire. What is it? What are some qualities about fire? Fire. Okay, when you think of fire, what do you think of? Hot, right? Okay, fire of the Holy Spirit. It gives warmth. It gives energy to our life. That's what one of the Im- imagery of the Holy Spirit is fire. But also fire is this also. Say in a dark room, and there's no light switches but only a candle. You light a candle. What does that fire give you? Light. It gives you insight into the faith. You penetrate deep into the faith. You understand things about the faith that you never do before. Okay. And what about another thing? What's another image? We talked about light. We talked about fire. And another thing. Watch me. What? Breath, right? Breath, ruach. So, the Holy Spirit, life, fire, breath. When we think of breath, what do we think of? If you don't breathe, what happens? You die, right? So, the Holy Spirit gives us life, the breath of God himself. 
to understand things the way God understands. That's what the Holy Spirit does. This is why it's important. You know, they say sacrament of, of uh, confirmation is one of the sacraments of initiation. Have you heard that, sacraments of initiation? What's the first sacrament of initiation you receive when you're a babe? Baptism, okay? And then when you're a little older, you receive what? Eucharist, Holy Communion, right. And then you receive confirmation. Now, why do you receive confirmation after baptism? Because baptism, excuse me, confirmation is considered a sacrament of maturity. It builds on the grace of baptism. Now, when you are baptized, you become a son and daughter of the church. You have the right, they call it the Janus Ecclesias. You've heard the month January. January in Latin means door. It opens the door and gives you access to receive the other sacraments like First Holy Communion, penance, reconciliation, marriage as you get older maybe, or holy orders. All right. So, confirmation builds on the grace of baptism. The Holy Spirit you receive in baptism is increased, so you have the power to witness to your faith, to bear witness to your faith, to know your faith, to convert others to the faith, to be strong in your faith. That's what confirmation, that means confirm, right? means make strong. Okay. Do we have any questions? Yes, sir. The Holy Spirit, yes. Okay, the Holy Spirit is the third person in the Holy Trinity. It's defined as the love of God. So God's love is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that power of God himself to make us understand the faith. For example, at Pentecost Sunday, the apostles were given the fire and the Holy Spirit. They did not totally understand Jesus' teaching. But when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they had the inner insight of God himself to really fully understand what Jesus was teaching him, the spirit of truth, okay? The ability to evangelize. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. The power of God himself, his love, his truth. And, very interesting observation, what is the relationship of the Holy Spirit to the church. Now, there's several different names for the church. People of God, body of Christ, temple of the Holy Spirit. All right. So, what is the relationship of the Holy Spirit? What is the Spirit to the body? Can anyone say, venture a guess? You have a spirit in you, don't you? You got a soul, right? Okay. So the Holy Spirit is the soul of the church. It's that power from God himself that gives the church the ability to know false teaching from true teaching, to expand the faith, to extend God's love to all of creation. Okay. So the Holy Spirit then is that we call it animating, gives life gives understanding, it gives power to evangelize and to convert. All right. So we have any other questions? That was a good question. All right. I want to talk a little bit before we go on about the importance of the Holy Eucharist. We talked about the Holy Eucharist as food, right? We need food to eat and to feed and to keep our faith strong. Now, I'm going to give you a phrase. You'll recognize it as soon as I say it. This is my body, okay? Let's take that word. This is my body. All right. When are these words said? During the Mass, right? Do we know what the Mass is? The Mass is defined as the continuation, the perpetualization, the memorial, the continuation of the sacrifice of the cross and of Calvary. All right? So, when Jesus says, this is my body, what happens? 
what happens? Bread and wine become the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Okay. Yes, sir. You have a question? No. Okay. Yeah. Now, we're going to talk about it just a second. So the priest holds it up, right? He says, this is my body. This is my blood. All right. Now, you're 12, 12. You're well-versed in English grammar, right? My least favorite subject in school, by the way, when I was your age. And when you study grammar, you study that there's, there are certain parts of speech, right? Verbs, adverbs, participles, articles, right? That sort of thing. All right. So let's take, let, let's, let's grammatically analyze this. This. Okay? This. Now, when I make a statement, this is a young man. Is, that a fig is he a figment of my imagination? He exists, right? He's got size, weight, color, right? Dimension. So, when Jesus lifts up, like you said, when Jesus lifts up and says, this is my body, he's making a statement. He's pointing to something that really exists. And, of course, it's a, this is a demonstrative pronoun. What's a pronoun? Someone tell me? Defined as person, place, thing, right? Okay. So he's pointing to himself. This is my divine person. Is there any symbolism in that? No, it's very literal, right? Like I point, this is a young man. There's no you know, ambiguity here, right? This is my divine person. That's what he's saying. The word is, let's take a look at that, is, first person singular verb to be, right? So he's saying, this is my really existing person, divine person. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. Somebody asked me before, it's a divine, he's a divine person. All right. So what's the difference between this is my body, this was my body, this will be my body. What's the difference in those three statements? Someone tell me. Tense, right. This was my body. What tense is that? Past. This will be my body. Future. Okay, but what does Jesus say? This is my body. What tense is that? Better believe it. Present. This is my body. Really existing, my divine person really existing. Now, see, in the present. And so we say the real presence. Have you ever heard that term, the real Eucharistic presence of Jesus? He's present three ways. He's present as a person, personally present to us. Okay? Number two, he's present to us as love. Because this Holy Spirit is also the Spirit of good Jesus, because he's God, right? All three, three persons, one God. And he's also present to us now, right now. So anytime a priest says, this is my body, this is my blood, bang, Jesus is there. Now, let's analyze this a little further. Why do believe, why do we believe in Jesus? Why do we believe when he says, this is my body, this is my blood, Jesus says those words to the priest, that the body and blood is really present? What is it about Jesus that we believe in? Why do we believe in Jesus? What is it? Who is he? Who is he? God, right? What is it about God that we believe? Remember? How do we spell God? G O D, right? Add one letter. Tells you why we believe in God. I always like to play word games. Good. Good. Got a sharp group here. I like that. Yeah. I can work with you. Yeah. Okay, good. G O O D. God is good. Don't forget it. Now, when we say 
God is good. What does that mean? What makes a person good? Let's put it, let me give you a little clue. What makes a person trustworthy? Can someone tell me? Why do you trust someone? What is it about a person that you can trust? Yes, yes, someone? Yes. Good, yeah, okay. But we're going to develop the goodness, okay? What makes a person good? Especially when they speak. They speak to what? To truth. That means they don't what? There you go. So, we believe in what Jesus says because he is God. This is my body really becomes the body and blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because God is good. That means God is all good. There's no evil in God. Because God is all good. He cannot lie to us and deceive us. Can we lie? Oh, you better believe it. Okay? But God is all good. He himself cannot lie. So when he says, this is my body, this is my blood, we believe it. Even though we can't see the bread and wine actually change into blood. Although, let me tell you something. In the United States, there's a group of um, um, photos and everything. It's called the Vatican Exhibit of Eucharistic Miracles. It shows you how in 20 years, all through 20 centuries of hist history of Christianity, there are places where there are hosts that are flesh. I've seen it myself, like in Lanciano, Italy. There's a host... And you can see flesh. It's flesh. It, and they analyze it. It's cardiac, cardiac heart uh, tissue. And then there's blood, you know, coagulated. And it's been there for at least a thousand years. And so there are Eucharistic miracles to show us that, yes, this is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we believe it because God is all good, cannot lie to us on the testimony of God himself, right? And because as all knowing, see, he cannot deceive us. All right. So, this is the importance and reason of going to church and receiving our Lord to receive his strength. Now about adoration. Let's talk about a little bit about Eucharistic adoration because you're doing some of that, right? When you are adoring Jesus, you are in the presence of God himself. You're in the presence of a divine person right there when he's on the monstrous and he's showing you. Now, the point I want to make about Eucharistic adoration, very important. Have you ever heard somebody, maybe a younger, older sister, maybe an uncle, maybe one of your uh, mothers, grandmothers, or fathers or dads, say, I don't go to church because God's everywhere? Have you ever heard that nonsense? Yeah, of course, I'm sure you have. And that's only partially true. God is present everywhere in his divine nature. Yeah, as creator of the world, sure, sure. But, here's the thing, here's the big but. In the Holy Eucharist, in adoration, in the monstrance, in the consecrated Eucharistic species at Mass, God is only present in his human, notice the distinction I'm making here? His human nature. You know, I'm a philosopher. I always ask why. I used to drive my, when I was your age, I used to drive my uh, teachers crazy. Do you ever know, do you ever, is there one of you guys, is there a guy in your class, why, 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 why? Is anyone around you, you anyone you like that? Or, or, or is there a big tall guy who says, was always arguing, you know? Okay, that was me. I was that guy, and uh, we call it high school, secondary school, okay? I've always asked Why? But you know something? When you ask why and you study, you get a few answers. Yeah. Okay. So, Jesus is only present in his human nature in the consecrated Eucharistic species. Why is that important? Because when you read the, you hear the Gospels every Sunday, right? And what happens every Sunday? What is Jesus doing usually every Sunday? He's mercy and love. And how is he expressing that? Good. What's he doing? 
Some power's coming out of him every Sunday, usually, in the Gospels. What's he doing? Preaching. But he's also doing something what? What's he doing with blind persons? They get their sight, right? Crippled people, they get up and walk. People of leprosy, they're healed. Miracles. Right. So, Jesus in his human nature is only in the consecrated Eucharist species. It's important to come to adore him because in the Eucharist, in his human nature, is God the miracle worker. You see? God the miracle worker. You want miracles. Healing. You got a hard studies, you know? When I was in the uni, I graduated with two mass, two majors, and a minor. Scholastic philosophy, classical languages, Greek and Latin, then I had a minor in theology. And man, I was crazy. I was taking 21 credit hours, seven classes a semester. Can you imagine that? In my last year, when I was a senior in uh, the uni, I was studying for a master's degree, too. And you know what I did to lighten the load? I spent an hour praying for Jesus to give me the clarity, the insight, the miraculous strength to continue my studies, to get it all in focus while I'm studying what I want. You want miracles of healing. You've got problems in your family. You want to pray for the world to get better. Pray before the blessed sacrament, and the miracles will happen. You know, I had a nephew. For 20 years, he lived a very immoral life. He had a lot of girlfriends, you know, and he had a lot of uh, affairs. One even died chasing him in the car, you know. And uh, I prayed for him. One day, he met a wonderful girl. He was an electrician at a, at a hotel. She was getting her master's in hotel ma uh, management. And he met her, and he fell in love with her. This girl was from Lima, Peru. Imagine, if it takes a girl from Lima, Peru to straighten out my nephew, wow, what a miraculous uh, answer to your prayers. God will answer your prayers, but it takes time, right? You've got to persevere. You've got to keep praying. And I tell you, when you pray before the Blessed Sacrament, every time with the right attitude, you will get the strength to deal with your problems. Because it's like this. You want good friends, don't you? You don't want friends who are bad, right? Why? Because if you have good friends, more than likely you become what? A good person, right? Same thing. When you spend time in the company of Jesus, he's your friend. Jesus is your friend. What's what he said, didn't he? You, I call you no longer whatever. I call you friends. But you know something? We're more than friends. To Jesus. We're more than friends. We're son, his sons and daughters through baptism. The minute you were baptized, you became a son and daughter of God, capable of developing relationship. So the more we spend time with Jesus before the blessed sacrament, the more we go in friendship with Jesus. The more we become one with Jesus. That's, that's the word communion. Do you know that's what the word communion means in Latin? To become one with. Do we study Latin here? Oh, last I, Latin, uh, last Latin course in Western Australia was in 1972. Oh my gosh, that was, I was in the uni then. Oh my gosh, whoa. I taught Latin about a dozen of my years of teaching, by the way, in the United States in the 70s and early 80s. I was a Latin teacher. Imagine me as a Latin teacher. So anyway, okay. So, the word communion in Latin means to become one with. So the more you receive Jesus in the Eucharist, the more you pray with Him, the more you become one with Him, the more you grow in friendship with Him, the more you become like Jesus. And how do we know? Because we grow in charity. We become more divine-like. We become more unselfish. We become more charity, right? We more become chaste, chaste. We become wiser. We become stronger in our faith. That's what happens when you spend time with Jesus. You become like him more, and the problems that are thrown your way, you can be able to handle it. And you know some? You can get healing yourself. I've been healed. I had a brain tumor a few years ago. 
I prayed, took some medication, was gone within a year. My uh, sugar, I don't know, is anyone here studying for medicine? Okay, sugar diabetes. My, my sugar level was 45. Man, it was four and a half times what it should have been. Prayed, did a little workout, you know. <laughs> Went back to my old athletic habits. Dropped about 50 kilos in the last 10 years. And now my sugar level is normal. It's 80. Or 8 to 10. 80 in the United States. 80 to, 80 to 100. Okay. I don't have any cartilage in my knees. Be a candidate for uh, knee replacement because I used to do crazy things like gridiron and basketball and baseball and wrestling and Olympic style weightlifting and throwing the shot in the discus. And I put a lot of wear and tear on my body. But I got healed. Prayed before the Blessed Sacrament so I can continue. I said, I can't take two years off to get my knees fixed up and healed. I want to keep going. I want to make it to Australia another five times, you know. Make it here ten times before I die. So, spend time before our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll grow in friendship. you become more like Him. You'll have more power. And you lead others to Christ. That's the best way. Through your own power, your own example. So do we have any questions? Any questions whatsoever? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Uh, from age 16, which would have been grade 11, till I was 41 years old. Yeah, I had a 25-year career, uh, blew up my quad, and that's how my career ended. So 25 years. Okay, any other questions? I mean, it doesn't have to be on the Holy Spirit or uh, Holy Communion. So any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, as a priest, I have to read the breviary, so I, priest, pr uh, I pray at least six times a day, sometimes eight. I spend an hour for the Blessed Sacrament. I practice what I preach. I spend an hour for the Blessed Sacrament every day. And guess what? I study every day, two hours. Do you know that? I got seven degrees, graduate and undergraduate. I went to school until I was 48 years old. You think it's tough now? Imagine going to school till you're 48. And... Uh, I read the catechism every day, I read the Bible every day, I read beautiful works on spirituality. One book I'd recommend for you for spiritual reading, you know, is The Imitation of Christ, right? Hey, I'm an old school teacher, you know, I got the old eye. All right, so, Imitation of Christ, second most read book. That's what we want to do. We want to imitate Christ in our life as close as we can. And I do other things. Any other questions? Good questions. Yes, ma'am. Um, like you say about how we perform some miracles and stuff, but like, how do you explain that stuff in the fall, in the earthquake and stuff? Like, how do you explain that? Okay, a lot of times those kind of earthquakes, very good questions, are what they call chastisements. It's God's way of awakening us from our sinful pattern of behavior and to reconsider the sinful path we are taking to avert punishment by suffering a little bit in this life and then going in the right way. So basically, that's what the explanation is. These evils that are allowed, they call permissive providence. Very good question. Any other questions? Okay, if there isn't any, then we're about 2.30, right? Okay, yes, sir. Life or death? Oh, there definitely is life after death. Well, it's interesting. We do have a reincarnation. But the Christian understanding of reincarnation is that on the last day when Jesus will come in uh, judgment, judge the living and the dead, our bodies will be united with our souls. So we will have a reincarnation, but it's a little bit different than the Buddhist, right? Remember one time a uh, Catholic who became a Buddhist, he, he, she told me, she says, Father... I'd go back to the Catholic Church, but they don't have a doctrine of reincarnation. You know what I told her? I said, you know some, You spend 60, you're young, you know, but you spent 60, 80, 100 years in this life. In the last 10 years, you're in a wheelchair. You get heart attacks, you get strokes, you get diabetes, maybe you lose your eyesight. You get all these sicknesses and illness, heart attacks. I says, and you want to come back here and do it all again? 
No way. One life. Why did you live 60, 70, 80, 100 years? Do it well. Live your life well once. And you get an eternity of happiness after life in heaven. He guarantees that. What did our Lord say about the Eucharist? He who eats my body, drinks my blood, John chapter 6, will have eternal life. And why do we believe in God? Because he's what? Good. And because he's good, he does not what? And because he's lie, he can be totally trusted, right? See, I'm an old school teacher. I, I repeat myself, right? Repetition, mother of wisdom. Okay. Any other questions? About time? Okay. Thank you. All right. Let me end by giving you all a blessing, okay? The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the day.